Let's pray. Holy God, almighty and all-powerful God, thank you for your word. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, work in us ever greater faith for following Jesus, for praising him, for praising you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are a lot of courageous people in the Bible. We think of Joshua, right? Joshua and the walls of Jericho. We think of Daniel and the lion's den. We think of David and Goliath. But there's also brave and courageous people in the New Testament as well. We think of Peter. Peter, who preached even though they were under the threat of imprisonment or even worse. We think of Stephen, who stood fast in his faith even though he was martyred for it. And then we come to Paul as well. Paul, who actually persecuted the church at first, but then because of Jesus Christ, became one of the greatest missionaries ever, if not the greatest missionary ever. He had a zeal for the gospel, and as we talked about in our study in Galatians, drew a line in the sand, and he stood firm. So we take a look at these people and think how courageous we are. How We are. They are, right? How courageous they are. But where does that courage come from, really? When you take a look at each and every one of them, that courage comes from from knowing the Lord, knowing he, he, who He is, His Word, His promises. Right? That's really where it comes from. People who know the Lord, who know His Word and His promises, have the courage to stand firm no matter the circumstances. See, the problem is, we take a look at all of these people in the Bible. We took a look at Joshua, at David, at Daniel, at Peter, and, and, and Paul, and we say, well, if we could just model how they acted, then that would be okay. But if we're modeling just how they act, that's just the external aspect. That's not the source of their courage. The courage doesn't come from within. It comes from him who is above. It comes from knowing God and trusting his promises. You see, we make our faith really complicated sometimes, don't we? In, in a very simple aspect is to trust who God is. To have confidence in who he is and his word. And then follow through on his word. Or as the song says, trust and obey. The essence of our faith is to trust, and then to follow his word. This is really the story of Joshua. God and his promises. Because it all begins with the promises of God. So let's go to our text this morning. It says this, Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... The Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead, now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving you, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you just as I, has prom I have promised Moses. Now a lot of people... Uh, have heard the name Joshua, they know about Jericho, but don't know too much about him himself. So let's just do a little thumbnail sketch of who he is. Joshua. Joshua, when you read, is Moses' aide and confidant. He is his close aide uh, and confidant throughout. He is the one who went to Mount Sinai with him and waited as he came back down. He is the one, one of 12 spies who went into the land of Canaan. But he and Caleb were the only two who came back 
with a positive report. The other ten spies said, oh, they're too powerful for us. And thus those ten spies did not make it into the promised land. He's also a military commander. And he defeated the Amalekites in the wilderness. But perhaps most interesting is his name. His name was originally Hosea. So that means salvation or deliverance. Moses gave him a new name, Joshua, which means Yahweh, the Lord God, right? Yahweh is salvation or deliverance. Now, interestingly enough, in the Greek, his name is written Jesus. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it should. Jesus. Jesus. So what we find in Joshua, in his name, is that he is a type of Christ. What do I mean when I say a type of Christ? A foreshadowing of Jesus Christ himself. You take a look at Joshua. Joshua led people into the promised land, right? Does Christ Jesus lead us into the promised land? Oh yeah, and it is an eternal promised land that he leads us in. Joshua represented the people before God and was a minister before Yahweh. Jesus represented us all. And he took the sin of the world upon himself and brought it before God. Now, Joshua did not act, was not a mediator of a covenant. Moses was that mediator. But Joshua was certainly a minister of the covenant that was given to the Israelites. Jesus is not only the minister, he is the mediator of the covenant. He himself is that covenant. I mean, we could keep drawing all of these lines, if you will, but from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there is a direct connection from Joshua to Jesus. Jesus, Yahweh saves. So that's just a little bit of a thumbnail of Joshua. So I hope you can see that Joshua is not just this one character somewhere in the Old Testament. He was integral to Israel. He was a hero of Israel, if you will. And so God talks to Joshua. And he says, you are to go into the promised land. You are to lead the Israelites into the promised land. But he doesn't just say, all right, go on your way now. He actually encourages, uplifts Joshua with a couple of things. The first is he reiterates the promises to Joshua. He says, this land that you're going to have is not yours because of who you are, but because of who I am. It's going back to our text here. It says, Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving them. Not that you will take, but that I am giving them. To the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you just as I promised Moses. So we could actually go back to the promises that God gave to Moses, but it goes back even further. Do you know to whom God gave that promise of land? Do you remember who it was? Abraham. God gave that promise to Abraham, and he had reiterated that promise throughout. If you go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, the, uh, the beginning of chapter 12, this is one you should probably highlight or bookmark in your Bible. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse 
and in all the, all the fam- and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. If you take a look, it's God who does the promises. I will show you, I will make you, I will bless you, and so on. God makes a covenant, a sacred promise with Abraham, and it is an unconditional promise. It's not a promise that is conditioned if Abraham keeps his part. God said, I will do this. And that promise is true because of who God is. God makes a promise and he is steadfast in his covenant. As a matter of fact, to Joshua, he says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Right? He's not just sending them off. He says, I will not leave you or forsake you. What a good promise to hear, right? I will not leave you or forsake you. You see, we take a look at the Old Testament and we just think of all of these laws and things that God has given, but oh, it's so rich with promises. And we need to hear those promises again and again, I will not leave you or forsake you. There's this love of a father talking to his children And as children, they need to be reminded again and again and again, reassured, if you will, that their father will always be with them. And as rebellious teenagers who run away from home and disregard all the wealth of the father, we need to hear the father say, come home. I love you. I have not moved. I am here for you. And as adults, just like sheep, we wander off the path and go down ways that we should not go, and we often get lost. And thus we need to hear the Father's voice calling us again and again as a shepherd calls to his sheep. He calls us by name. And we need to hear those promises, I will not leave you or forsake you. And we need to hear those especially when we are given a difficult task at hand. I mean, think about the task that God has given Joshua to go into the promised land. I mean, they had spied. They knew that the enemies would be there and that there would be battles. So he tells Joshua to go in, but I will never leave you or forsake you, even though the road is difficult. Jesus says the same thing to us. I will not leave you as an orphan. And I have given you a task. I have given you a task of telling others about me. Of going into a world that is hostile to who I am, to the gospel message. And go and make disciples. He he said, all power and authority has been given to him. Therefore, do this. And at the very end, that very end, he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, courage that we have comes not from within, but from him who is above all things. We don't look within for our courage. We look to God for His Word, His promises, and we cling to those. Even Paul, right? The greatest missionary. He said, I had a thorn in my side. But he said this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul had courage because of the confidence he has in Christ Jesus. See, confidence in God, who God is and his promises 
is the basis of our faith. Confidence is nothing other but trust. To trust who God is and his word. That's the basis for our faith. And we have a steadfast, steadfast God. So we should have a steadfast faith. So God tells all of this to Joshua. And then he says, therefore, because of who I am, because of the promises I have given, be strong, be courageous. He says, be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be, ve- be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all that the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. So a couple things to notice about this, Right? One is the repetition. So if something is repeated in Scripture, if God says something and he says, be strong and courageous three times, we should pay attention to that, right? (laughs) How many times do you have to tell the children the same thing before they get it? Right? We have to encourage. I mean, and face it, we're just big, we're kids in big bodies, right? That's for the most part. So we need to hear this repetition, be strong and courageous. And the first part is be strong and courageous because you're going to go into that land. But notice, notice something very different here. It says only be strong and very courageous. What does he have to be very courageous about? Following God's word. That actually takes the most courage. Only be strong and courageous, being careful to do according to all that the law my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may have good success wherever you go. You see, Joshua's primary duty is not military, it is spiritual. That's his primary duty. It is a spiritual duty to take God at his word and then follow his word no matter what. This, brothers and sisters, has been the issue from the very beginning. Go back to the garden, right? God said you can have anything from any tree except that one. You do that one, you die. And Did they originally take God at his word? Yeah. But then they listened to the serpent. Did God really say? God didn't really mean that, right? And so you find a watering down of God's word, right? It's not really such a big deal. I mean, remember, Moses went up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. And then what did the people do within that 40 days? They built an idol, right? A golden calf. And Moses was so mad he took the tablets and just broke them. Did God really say, do we really have to follow his word? Can't we just kind of follow our own? You know, in Bible study, it came up, we were, uh, this was brought up, uh, things that Jesus never said. And um, I, I thought it would be appropriate to do some of those things. Things that Jesus never said versus things that Jesus did say. So one thing was, Jesus never said, live your truth. What Jesus actually said, I am the truth. Follow your heart. Jesus said, follow me. Do what makes you happy. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Believe in yourself. Jesus said, believe in me. And then the last one, just believe that's all that's asked. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he also said in the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
right? What does God's Word actually say? So here's the question. Was Jesus serious, and it's a rhetorical question, was Jesus serious about people following his word? Yes, right, I know it's a rhetorical question. He was serious, right? He wasn't just like, hey, you know, if you think about it, when you got a moment, just consider doing, following my word. He was serious about it, wasn't he? To follow Jesus was to not only believe in him, but to obey what he commanded. You see, for a lot of, a lot of people, that word obedience, don't like it, right? Many people believe Jesus, but it kind of stops there. There's no, accord, there's no corresponding obedience to his word. Well, I believe in Jesus, that's it. I mean, we talked about this. We did talk about this during the whole uh, series in Galatians, right? Obedience to his word. Sometimes there are churches and people who get legalistic about it. As a matter of fact, within most Lutheran bodies, I don't know if I've ever heard a preacher or sermon say obedience is necessary, right? I mean, in some Lutheran bodies, it's like heresy. Ooh. Why is it heresy? Because Luther and all of us have worked so hard to separate salvation from obedience. Because a lot of people say, well, if I just obey, then I'm saved. But that's not it, is it? I mean, we covered that extensively in our series in Galatians. Obedience does not save you. Rather, because you are saved, you obey. So I talked about, now that you're saved, act like it. Or in our song that we had, perfect song for today. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and all and with all who will, trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You want to be happy? Trust and obey. Now, might not be happiness like the world has happiness, right? But there's a happiness, a joy that then transcends what the world gives you. Following his word. You know, Verse 8 from Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, it, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, prosperous and then you will have good success. So what's the book of the law? By the way, the book of the law is really the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five, and tukos meaning scroll, or the first five scrolls of the Bible. And it's called the law because to Moses, through Moses, the law was given. But as I talked about before, it's not just the law, it's not just the commands. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew, law has a greater sense of not just commands, but the promises as well. And so there's a richness in God's word in which we have not only his commands, but his promises. And the nation of Israel was to cherish his word and then do his word. I mean, this... This was what was to be on the hearts of all Israelites. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's the Shema, which means hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house or when you walk by the way, or and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. God's word was to be before them all of the time. And it wasn't just for the adults. This was for the children as well. See, what does it mean to raise a successful child in Israel? Is one who honors God, right? Who knows his word. Interestingly enough, there was a, a national poll. Uh, I don't remember if it was Gallup or something else. It talked about goal setting with children. And within that, I don't think any household or very few had following Jesus as the top goal. I mean, you think about it. I, growing up, I didn't have that as a goal. I mean, we, we were good church goers, but that's what we did. Just, you know, went to church. I've said that before. But there was never a goal of, look, what I want most of you, Clayton, is for you to grow up and to follow Jesus. I never heard that. Did your parents ever tell you that? I, I mean, it happens so little. And we talk about the state of our country, and I think it really goes back to that. That we say, yeah, I believe, and that's all I have to do, don't have to obey, and I don't have to have his word in front of me or in front of my children. Now, Levi's not here today, right? <laughs> Levi, smart as whip, right? He's being trained up, isn't he? 10, 11 years old, he is a um, seminary student in work. Uh, and by the way, we prayed for him today. He broke his wrist. I know. So you can keep him in, his, in the prayers. I'm sure he has it all decorated, though. Probably wrote some Bible verses on it. No. <laughs> But, you know, going back here, it says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You know, when we talk about success, we normally talk about it in earthly ways, don't we? We talk about how much money you have, or do you have the right profession, or something like that. But what is biblical success, if you want to call it biblical success? Bibl biblical success is being known and loved by God and serving Him in all that we do with the reward of entering into the joy of His presence. That's really it. Psalm 16 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy. And, and we know this one from Matthew. Jesus said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I mean, these are sweet words, right? These are sweet promises. I mean, how do you enter into the joy of the Lord? For us, it's knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior, who suffered, died, and rose again for your sin, that you may be forgiven, that you may be free. And you enter into that joy, that life, that fills you, and then you live your life serving Him in however it may be, as a husband, as a wife, as a grandmother, as a grandpa, as an aunt, as an uncle, as a mechanic, as an architect, as a landscape, landscaper or an interior designer. Any one of those things, right? You do it unto the Lord doesn't mean you enter into professional ministry. That's not what it's about. It's however God has gifted you, you do that to the fullest for 
him his kingdom. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. These are promises, right? Promises of God given to us through his word. So for you today, how do we, uh, do you desire assurance of faith? For some of you, you need that assurance. Meditate upon his word and his promises. Do you desire a courageous faith? Trust who he is and his word. Do you desire a spirit-filled faith and life? Read his commandments and obey. See, there's something about following his word that gives you a different life. And you then become filled with his joy when you're following his word. It's actually really simple, isn't it? And throughout all of this, we need to pray, right? Because on our own, we are that child, we are that teenager, we are that adult lost sheep. So we continue to pray, asking for his guidance. If you want it in a very simple way today, trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Amen? Amen. Amen. 